Cala espera. Okay. Before I start properly, I'm going to ask everybody to, to do a safety management two exercise. <laughs> First of all, if you've still got your jacket on, take it off because it's been a long day and it's getting very warm. <laughs> Come on, do it. Don't be shy. If you're not too warm, the next thing I want you to do is stand up, turn to the person next to you, and shake them. their hand, and give them a smile. <laughs> we are starting being physical now. Okay. I think I've tried to move you from safety management 1.0 to safety management 2.0. The colleagues up in the previous panel all referred to tiredness after lunch, but kept going. So they knew what the problem was, but they didn't change behaviours. I've tried to change your behaviour to address that problem. That is safety management 2.0. Now, if you were here last year, that's slightly... You'll have seen this, okay? No apologies for showing it again, because getting the right crew on board, having sensible systems, and trying to get them to display safety behavior will lead to safety culture. It's not easy. You have to try hard every single day within your company to get a safety culture going. And safety culture is a very delicate beast. Once it gets out there into the harsh commercial reality, it's very easily damaged or even destroyed by what the commercial reality is. In particular, the actions that the seafarer sees going on ashore that don't quite match the communications around safety. So we have to be very careful. So instead of putting your company at the center of your safety culture and your efforts to promote safety, you have to put your seafarers at the centre. It's about people. And we have to move from safety management 1.0, which is about systems, acknowledging there's a problem, saying, that's a problem, let's put a system in place, to saying, that's a problem, let's change behaviour. I thought the, uh, the, the talk about enclosed space entry was particularly apt for this. Because enclosed space entry happens because the right behaviours aren't displayed. It's not about training usually. It's about having the right behaviours and the right systems in place to support seafarers. What is an enclosed space? Well, there's a dictionary definition, but if you walk around a ship, all sorts of spaces are potentially dangerous. So even the terminology we use in safety management 1.0 doesn't necessarily support seafarers in their everyday job. You need to think about terminology to support them. Call it a dangerous space. Put a label on it, dangerous space. And then they might start thinking about it. I'm going to talk a bit about the things I'm seeing because I'm actually very optimistic. The ISM code was... Uh, it's the wrong book. Forgot me book. In the latest edition of Apostolus magazine, it says, ISM code 20 years old, what next? Yeah? ISM, first 20 years, is safety management 1.0. Mechanistic approach. System, 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 system. Yeah? But not much person, 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 person. And in order to get gains going forward, it will need to be person, 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 person. And I talk about some of the things I'm seeing. Training. Training is getting better. We are training people more professionally and we're getting better outcomes as an industry all the time. But we might need to think about how we're training people. It's not just about technical skills. Yeah? It's about teaching them to intervene. Teaching them to interact with the shore side teaching them to interact 
with each other. Soft skills are becoming more and more important. The roles and responsibilities of sailors going forward. Loads of buzzwords today. Digital disruption, autonomy, hyper-regulation, commercial expectations, sustainable development, hyper-regulation, data and artificial intelligence, I'll throw that in, and Internet of Things. Change is coming, whether we like it or not. And the roles and responsibilities of each one of us, ashore and afloat, are going to change fundamentally. As an industry, we need to get the people in and train them in the right way if we're to succeed in the future. It's absolutely vital that we do this. We must recognise that in the future, your seafarer is going to be more of a monitoring and intervention type role, and he's not going to be a doer. He's going to stand there, and he's going to monitor systems. He's not doing things anymore. He won't necessarily be navigating the ship. He'll be there to intervene. And that's going to be a fundamental change. Technology. I am... Um, my head is exploding with the amount of technological change that is possible in the industry. I keep uh, very closely abreast of autonomous ships. I chair the IG Working Group on Autonomous Ships, uh, and uh, I'm very heavily involved in cyber risks at North. And the technologies out there are fundamental to change what's happening. What we need to do is use them in the right way. In the past, we've had technologies foisted upon us. Uh, the prime example, and one of the worst examples, ballast water treatment systems. Put on ships, nobody can agree what you should have. Very difficult. Will they actually work? Who knows? So we get these technologies foisted upon us. Ectus is another one. By manufacturers. It sounds good at the time, but it isn't necessarily the right thing for the industry. So we need to think fundamentally now about these technologies and how we might as an industry use them and how we're going to train our people and get our people to road test them so they can say, well, actually, that helps me. Yeah? Because if it doesn't help them, is it helping your business? Probably not. The worst example of technology being foisted in the industry are uh, release mechanisms on lifeboats. That was just a disaster for the industry. With a hook and a metal ring, sometimes you got crushed fingers, maybe a bind in the head. Lifeboats didn't fall and people weren't killed. So as an industry, we need to look at these things and see that they will support our seafarers and put them in the hands of our seafarers before we buy them so that they can say, yes, this is a good thing. Other things that I'm seeing around support for the seafarer and which are absolutely key, are health and well-being. Health and well-being, mm, not something seafarers are really into. I'm a former seafarer, but I didn't really care that I was working too long hours, because that was the environment, that was the culture. These things are becoming socially unacceptable. It's not sustainable to have an industry where we're working people for far too many hours a day and having accidents where fatigue is a contributory factor. So we need to look at the health and well-being of our guys, of our guys both on and off ship. The, uh, Phil Sharples earlier was talking about wearable tech. I was talking to a ship owner two weeks ago and they have introduced uh, iPhones on board for people working alone. So they put it in their top pocket, and when they go horizontal, it sends an alarm, just in case something's gone wrong. Wearable tech is going to come, yeah, and it's going to be a challenge for us all. But it will allow real-time monitoring of our seafarers on board. And of course, mental well-being is something that a lot of people are talking about, and it's absolutely key to keeping these guys on board. As technology develops, minimum manning will probably reduce, uh, and having three or four people on ships on ocean-going voyages is going to be a challenge for them mentally. That's something that's really going to have to be looked at closely. Contractual terms and conditions. I'm seeing some owners pri prioritizing the welfare of the seafarers and their families. 
okay? Uh, I'm trying to create closer links between them and the seafarer by offering security of tenure, loyalty payments, pensions even. Amazing, huh? But this is safety management 2.0. That is what is sustainable and what we have to think about going forward. Next 20 years. It's not going to happen all at once, but it will start to happen. It's already happening. The biggest companies with the most cash and those that are involved in sectors where safety is critical commercially are doing these sort of things. It's only a matter of time before your commercial partners, whoever they may be, are saying operating in safety management 1.0 is unacceptable. You have to move forward. Safety management 1.0 allowed society to accept ships that sink, seafarers that are killed. Safety management 2.0 won't. It'll not be an option going forward because society won't allow it. And my last thing, sensible systems, is a particular bugbear of mine because I was at sea before ISM came in and after ISM came in uh, and I have seen how it has been, I would say, almost abused uh, to create monster that does not help the seafarer. Not in all companies, some enlightened companies are very good at it, but this is key to creating safety management 2.0. Everyone should examine their systems closely and they should look to making their systems more sensible. Something that supports the seafarer, that isn't 2,000 pages long and indecipherable to the average seafarer out there. If you don't do safety management 2.0, you'll be left behind by your competitors and you'll be left behind by societal expectations. So it's imperative for us all to do this. Up north, we've got lots of ideas about how to do that. Uh, and if you're a North member, we, we're quite happy to come and talk to you about them. And if you're not, come and talk to us anyway, because we're here to help. You can read some of those ideas ooh, at Insights. Thank you very much.